Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Bravo channel. This week I want to do something a little bit different. Less of a standard review, more of an analysis, because those are kind of fun to do sometime, right? And I'm going to compare two classic steampunk novels that I recently read, and I'll tell you why, that despite the fact that they're both the product of a very talented writer, one is merely good and the other is great. My opinion is probably exactly the opposite of what a highfalutin critic would say. <laughs> the two books are The Light Ages by Ian McLeod and Pasquale's Angel by Paul McCauley. The metric I'm using here is pacing, which in my view is something that's critically important. It's one of the most difficult writing skills to master, but it's one of the most important as well for anybody who wants his novels to be well received. The pacing of one of these books differs markedly from the other, and I'm going to tell you why that is and why it's important. Steampunk is one of the genres in which the setting is everything, almost everything, like the American Western, which is also defined by where it takes place. But unlike the Old West, it's not truly historical. I mean, it's got some really bizarre changes which actually make it steampunk rather than historical fiction. For this reason, steampunk writers, if they're good, are masters at world building. And McLeod and Macaulay are no exceptions. <laughs> they're both British, and they both have these cool Scottish names, so I imagine that there's you know, there's a bagpipe somewhere in their family tree. But on to the novels. First, The Light Ages, 2004 Gardner Books. The author's background is in law and civil service. This book takes place in Britain, but it's not a Britain we would recognize, even as steampunks. In this universe, the world progressed differently. Rather than going from steam to petroleum to nuclear power, instead, they went to ether. And I'm not talking about the anesthetic here. This is more like what they spell as aether, you know. It's a substance that we pump out of the ground, but it enables magic. And so it's really revolutionized the economy. With, with aether, you can build buildings taller, and you can uh, have trains go faster, and you can even create imaginary creatures that are, live and breathe, like unicorns and dragons. Yeah, I know our granddaughter would really be happy about that. Real unicorns. <laughs> and uh, with these right spells, everything's easier, so why bother with the old-fashioned engineering? The specialists that manipulate these, they formed guilds, because, you know, it's still challenging. You have a... You have a uh, Architects Guild, you have a Telegrapher's Guild for communications, and you have, of course, you have guilds that manipulate biology. The political situation is very different, too. They've overthrown the king, and uh, there's no parliament. It's strictly ruled by the guilds, which, in, the, in, one, in one sense, it sounds like a socialist dream. In the other sense, it's really not. <laughs> and so the substance itself, the ether, has a downside. It produces this residue that they call engine ice <laughs> that gets into everything. It's like this white dust. You know, it's not the kind that you find in a baggie in the White House. It is this a nuisance pollutant that, uh, that sometimes even gets into, makes a crust over buildings and so on if it's a really an industrial area. And worse still, ether is toxic. If you get exposed to too much of it, you can turn into a mutant, which they call a changeling. And these effects are very random. I mean, you can you can just have like ESP, for example, or you can start to turn into a monster. Uh, it, just, it all depends. And the public hates and fears them. And they have this gatherer's guild that tries to hunt them all down and throw them in this asylum called St. Blates. The protagonist is Robert Bar Barrows, or Robbie, as his friends call him, he grows up in a North English town called Bracebridge, which really does exist. I, I looked it up. 
Now, Bracebridge in this book is the center of ether extraction. In the story, both of his parents, both of Robbie's parents, work in ether related industries, of course. And his mother is involved in this horrible industrial accident in which she is overexposed. And she begins to turn into a changeling. Her body is stretching. She's becoming freakish, you know, like a cartoon Ichabod crane, basically. So she hides herself away in her room because she's afraid the gatherers are going to come and get her. Uh, and the, the father, you know, he's kind of heartbroken, so he becomes a drunkard. <laughs> and poor Robbie, he's got no, no uh, viable parents. But he does, you know, bond with this other changeling woman, a friend of his mother's, who's more normal somehow. Uh, and she has this ward that she adopted uh, who was orphaned by that same E3 accident. All, both her parents were destroyed from that. Her name is Annalise. And I think, I think at this time, it's, it's around puberty time for both of them, <laughs> somewhere around that, you know, 11 or 12. And he is immediately fascinated with her. She's a pretty little blonde, and, and she is smart, precocious, a little obnoxious, very adventurous. I mean, she's kind of the the kind of girl that a guy immediately says, oh my God, she's the one. <laughs> uh, and yet, things don't work out. Well, they can't. It's a novel. It's have to, it has to, <laughs> you have to have troubles. But, uh, you know, uh, Robbie moved to London after his mother kills herself. Very tragic. And he becomes a muckraking journalist, you know, with the radicals trying to better society. And yet he keeps running into Annalise. She has also moved to London. She's reinvented herself as Anna Winters, and she's like the society debutante. And everybody loves her. You know, she is charming. She's witty. She's She can do anything. She can play the piano like a virtuoso. And uh, she is even more beautiful. And of course, Robbie is still basically obsessed with her. But she doesn't want him around because he'll give away the game. <laughs> you know, people will, will realize that her parents died in an ether accident. She might herself be a changeling in progress. You know, it doesn't go well for Robbie. But somehow he gets inserted into this elite society where Anna is because one of her friends, Sadie, takes a fancy to him and he's actually having an affair with her. It goes through all these long, long uh, tribulations and trials of Robbie, because it's a lot like the Victorian society, only different. <laughs> and it's a very masterfully told story. It's very evocative. The language is beautiful. Uh, you, you, there, a lot of sensory detail, and uh, you just feel for the for for this guy. Uh, much more showing than telling. He's very good at that. And it reminded me a lot of Dickens's David Copperfield, which is not a bad thing to say. The other book is Pasquale's Angel, published 2010, Gateway Books. And Macaulay, the author, he's also a Brit. He lives in London, and he has a background as a research biologist. So here's a very different background for a very different author with a very different book. <laughs> this is not a fantastical future. This is an alternate past. And the hero is, of course, Pasquale, and he is an artist in Renaissance Italy. And He's a young and talented pa painter. He's only 18. He's uh, taken an apprenticeship with a better-known uh, older artist called Rosso. And uh, Rosso likes to, you know, produce stuff to keep food on the table. You know, portraits of, of noble women uh, or um, devotional pieces for some religious festival. So he keeps things going. But Pasquale, he has ambition. He wants to make the ultimate art something that people can't imagine, something they've never seen before, an angel like truly from heaven. That's what he wants to do. Of course, he's a young man. He's got that spunk and that spirit. The fun thing about the setting, which is Florence, Renaissance Florence, Italy, is that it's a steampunk Florence. Uh, the technology, the age of steam has happened early. So they do have steam power. They have... Uh, they have photography just being invented, and, and artists are worried about that. Uh, they have wars being waged with rifles and rockets. Uh, they have 
um, flying machines are being tested. <laughs> so it's really cool. All this, all this stuff is kind of different. And yet, uh, Pasquale meets all these historical personages uh, from uh, the artists Michelangelo and Raphael, not the turtles, <laughs> uh, the, the conniving Medici family, the astronomer Copernicus, who is Polish, actually, and most importantly, Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince in real life, one of my favorite books, <laughs> uh, because it's about scheming and how the prince should um, seize and hold power by lying and conniving. <laughs> Great book and, and serious. And, and people hated him in real life because he tried to reveal the truth. So in this steampunk world, the culture has even changed. Uh, they have, you know, cardinals smoking cigars <laughs> uh, because New World has brought them tobacco. And uh, Pasquale smokes cigarettes and marijuana because <laughs> he's a stoner artist, right? And uh, there's this Aztec woman, Palacial, who uh, one of the other artists he knows has brought back from the New World to be his servant. Well, he has having an affair with her. Uh, that is. Pasquale. She has peyote, <laughs> and she's giving him peyote to try to inspire him to have the visions that he needs to create his angel. In light of all of this, life gets in the way. <laughs> uh, there's this big visit from the Pope to Florence, which was a separate country at the time. It was a republic, and uh, Raphael, the artist that they favor, is like big guy in the delegation. He's giving a toast and he drinks a sip of wine, he drops dead from poison, which is a thing that happened a lot in, in Renaissance Italy. And so Pasquale's side job is being the assistant to the journalist uh, Machiavelli, former political philosopher, now muckraking journalist and full-time alcoholic. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Machiavelli is still pretty lucid, and he's got all these ideas about politics. And they're trying to figure out who murdered Raphael. Uh, there was another murder that they're pursuing where the guy had this clockwork toy in his pocket. And there's now people trying to kill them to get this toy. And they're trying to get it back to the creator, the master engineer of Florence. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if he was a historical character or not. But it's pretty cool. There's a lot of, of conniving in action. See, this is not a... A coming of age story like the light ages this is a murder mystery <laughs> plain and simple and pasquale has to go through all this weird stuff to help figure it out and there's also comic relief uh rosso has this pet barbary ape who's always getting into trouble and he actually you know figures into the story his name is ferdinand by the way <laughs> so pasquale is a very different guy than than uh robbie but he's also idealistic but he's impulsive, and he says to Palacial, I want to take you away back to the New World and uh, take you away from this, you know, this old man, and uh, and we'll be together. And, you know, she may not agree with it, <laughs> but at least he seizes the day. Whereas Robbie, he kind of hangs around Anna, protecting her, but not really trying with any with any success to win her over. So both of these are very well-crafted books with fantastic worlds they're set in. And yet, despite all the clever use of language, the profound themes, uh, the uh, emotional tugs that it puts at your heart, I found Light Ages a chore to get through. It was just so long <laughs> and so much to go through before you get to the good stuff. On the other hand, Pasquale's Angel grabbed me from the beginning. And I could hardly put it down. And I was disappointed when it was over. What was the difference? One thing. Pacing. It's not actually the only difference, but it's the difference that made the difference. Because there were other issues. For example, uh, Light Age is subtle. But Quali is blunt. Well, there's gay characters in both. And in, in, in Light Ages, it's just hinted at. But you figure it out. In Pasquale, it's in your face. And these Painters joke about, you know, uh, having affairs with teenage boys. <laughs> and they, you know, they accuse, they keep accusing Pasquale 
of being, you know, Rosso's lover, and he's like indignant because he likes women. <laughs> so uh, that difference, it's just interesting. It doesn't either make it or kill it for me, but uh, it's the pacing that does it. Because Paul's Angel is a short book that moves quickly. And yet, in other ways, it's just as detailed. I mean, even though it's just a very few days in Pasquale's young life. Whereas Robbie, Robbie lives through years. You know, it's decades <laughs> of, this, uh, of this book. And it ends in, in, in an epilogue where he's an old man. <laughs> Oh, not necessarily old man, but let's say he's middle-aged at the very least. Not all novels need to have murders and uh, conspiracies and violence to get us interested. But as a matter of fact, both of these do. <laughs> the issue is that whatever is going to happen, we want it to happen in a timely fashion so we don't lose interest. And it's a, it's a very, uh, very much of a balancing act. I mean, I think of, like, J.J. Abrams' movies, which, to my mind, move too fast. You can't even comprehend what's happening sometimes. Uh, whereas, you can contrast that with the first Star Trek movie, because I'm talking about Star Trek here, <laughs> which was so slow, you thought, oh my god, how long are you going to stare at this alien craft? <laughs> uh, so, it's a balancing act. And Pasquale does it perfectly, whereas the light ages, I think he's just trying to be too artistic. He just brings it on too long. Plus, uh, Robbie's a frustrating character. You want to grab him and shake him and say, What is your problem, man? There's Anna. You love her. Do your utmost to win her favor. <laughs> but he doesn't. He just kind of hangs around and, and tries to protect her like some kind of knight in shining armor. I know that a lot of men do this. Uh, it's a mistake, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, it doesn't endear him to me as a character who doesn't seem to learn as he goes along. So, that's my conclusion. Uh, the Squally's Angel is a much better book because of its pacing. And whereas uh, The Light Ages has a sequel, I don't know if I'm going to read it. Maybe, maybe not. not. Not very pressing in either way. So hopefully this, this will give you an idea of what makes a good book, and especially for other writers, how to make a good book. So please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. And any suggestions, I always appreciate them. I try to carry them out. Also, like and subscribe and share to get out the good steampunk word. Help make this genre grow. Also, as always, the links to my books on Amazon will be in the description. For now, this is the Steampunk Test Road saying, adios amigos from the Steampunk Test Road channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.